As we all know, World War II caused untold destruction across the world. It also brought massive political and cultural change. To this day, there are many unusual markers that have been left behind, remnants of a devastating time. For example, just off the coast of the UK, something very unusual is still standing, a collection of sea forts which were built to defend British sovereignty against the relentless German bombings throughout the early 1940s. And while the sea forts accomplished their goal, proving to be a valuable defense against German planes, their story extends far beyond World War II and even their military service. As after the war, these forts became a haven for pirate radio stations, planned explosions, and even an independent nation. So join me as we discover the history of the Monsell Sea Forts. I'm your host, Ryan Sokash, and you're watching It's History. This video is sponsored by Enlisted, a World War II multiplayer shooter with a strong focus on historical authenticity, dynamic gameplay, and keeping the action high at all times. Let me tell you, as someone who covers many World War II topics, I love how the game immersed me into the dramatic reality of such legendary times. My favorite vehicle was the 1942 Ford GPA Seep. This amphibious two and a half ton truck will deliver you to theaters of war in conditions that are simply unthinkable. Enlisted has realistic weapons, large scale combat zones, and a variety of soldiers. This game is a history buff's dream come true. The details are impressive. For example, Enlisted offers wide destructibility features, many objects on the map, including wooden fences, windows, shutters, and barrels can be destroyed in battle. So how can you play? Well, it's easy. Enlisted is available on PC, Xbox Series XS, and PlayStation 5, as well as PS4 and Xbox One with cross-platform support. There is no purchase necessary. You simply follow my link in the description to download and play for free. By following my link, you'll receive a free bonus of three days of premium time and several orders for troops and weapons. So don't miss out on play for free on PC, PlayStation, and or Xbox by clicking my link in the description box. No ifs, no maybes, let's all get enlisted. For a nation like England with massive coasts, naval fortifications are not uncommon. In fact, this has been the case ever since technology advanced enough to allow construction far out at sea. Hence, nations have been building coastal forts for hundreds of years. For example, several dozen forts still stand in the English Channel, which previously were used for defense from France in the Napoleonic Wars. Fast forward a little over a century, and with the advent of military aircraft and aerial combat, many thought that these types of stationary sea forts would be made obsolete. However, due to a British maritime engineer, Guy Monsol, these old sea forts would be upgraded and serve a vital role in World War II. You see, shortly after the Second World War had broken out, the German war machine quickly swallowed up all of Europe, with both the USSR and the US still neutral powers early on. Only one nation stood between Germany and total domination of the continent, or possibly the world, and that was the UK. Even under the oppressive boot of German military invasion, Britain refused to surrender, even defeating their mortal enemy in the Battle of Britain in 1940. So afterwards, in order to demoralize the British people and also prepare for a potential land invasion, Germany conducted a massive aerial bombing campaign which became known as the Blitz. For months on end, the German bombers wrecked havoc on industrial and military targets across the UK. While by mid-1941, the Blitz was categorized as a strategic failure from the point of view of the Germans, as they were not able to stop British production or really even demoralize the British populace. It was devastating all the same, given that around 40,000 civilians were killed. 
As Germany opened up a second front of war with their surprise attack on the Soviet Union and Operation Barbarossa, as well as the added stress of the American entry into the war after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, Germany's resources were limited by this point. So even though they were unable to continue conducting massive air raids over Britain, smaller attacks, especially on convoys of American goods being sent to support their allies, still occurred. Therefore, the British military needed to come up with a clever way to deter future assaults. It was here that Guy Monsol's engineering expertise and creative planning were put to use. Monsol had designed a series of forts that would be placed along England's coast to deter the Germans. The plans for these structures improved on older designs and added many new features based on modern military technology. Despite many doubting the effectiveness of the designs as well as the cost, plans were approved and construction began. The forts were then quickly built on land and later shipped out to their locations in the coastal areas where they would be pieced together. Named after their designer, these structures would come to be known as the Monsell Sea Forts. While the existence of such forts weren't all that perplexing, the spots where they were placed seemed relatively strange, with many calling into question the reasoning. However, there was absolutely a method behind the madness. Some of the forts were put up in the Thames estuary, where the river connects with the North Sea, while the others were situated in the Liverpool Bay. And this was done due to the expert studying of German Nazi flight patterns. You see, at this point of the war, the US was supplying Britain with vital aid and was keeping the country alive, both domestically and on the front lines. These essential materials, which included tanks, planes, rifles, as well as clothing and food supplies, were usually shipped across the Atlantic to ports in Liverpool and London. Therefore, Liverpool was a prime target for German bombers. Then, of course, cities like London and Birmingham were also targeted on account of their large volume of production. British military intelligence noticed, though, that German planes would often cross the English Channel, fly across the countryside before turning west towards Liverpool, whereas others would simply fly straight towards London and Birmingham. So locations of both fort complexes were perfectly placed to intercept German planes on their way to major cities. All the forts were also heavily armed, often surprising their German adversaries as most maritime outposts were expected to be civilian run and therefore unarmed. In general, the forts were armed with heavy 3.75 inch quick firing guns as well as 40 millimeter cannons. They also had massive searchlights that could easily spot German planes flying overhead. Technically, there were two different types of sea forts, army forts, and navy forts, and both had a distinct style and purpose. The navy forts were smaller structures consisting of a long platform held up by two large pillars. Upon this platform is where the small buildings and weapons lay. On the other hand, the army forts had a much more intricate design. These forts were actually a collection of five or six small defensive towers, all connected by long walkways, making up one large complex. They were also able to carry more firepower as a result. The majority of the army forts were located near Liverpool, while London mostly had naval forts for protection. I'd also note that the army forts and navy forts had slightly different purposes beyond just shooting down enemy bombers. For example, the navy forts were tasked with attacking German planes trying to lay mines in the water that would hit British or American ships sailing to London's docks. Navy forts were also very effective when it came to intercepting German V-1 rockets, which previously caused massive destruction across London. Throughout the duration of their service, these sea forts were extremely efficient, despite the doubts of many before their construction. For example, the forts in the Thames estuary shot down over 30 German V-1 rockets, 22 planes, and even one e-boat. Despite not having the correct munitions, their simple existence also deterred many German military operations and also served as a symbolic moral boost for the British people. But after World War II ended in Allied victory, the Monsell Sea Forts were no longer needed by the military. As a result, 
they fell into despair. In fact, their days were numbered before the war came to a close, even if they were a success in the long run. You see, while they were able to take down V-1 rockets, the sea forts could do nothing to stop supersonic V-2s. Then, as the Cold War seethed on, a military technology moved towards intercontinental ballistic missiles and advanced missile defense systems involving orbital satellites. These simple sea forts looked to become yet another forgotten relic of the past era of warfare. Without military maintenance, the elements of the unforgiving sea began to take their toll, with the wind and the waves damaging the support pillars, the salt water causing rust to eat away at the walkways and platforms. But while their military service ended with the close of the Second World War, the story of the sea forts certainly does not end here. Many became pirate radio stations and one claimed to become an independent nation. But to better understand their fate in the modern day, let's take a look at these forts individually. As was said before, the naval forts were primarily located in the Thames Estuary, where they protected major cities like London from bombers, as well as ships from landmines. Many of the naval forts found a new purpose in the 1960s, becoming host for several pirate radio stations. At the time, radio stations needed a license to play rock music, which was booming in popularity, with the rise of many prominent British rock bands. The station also played other media, such as comedy shows and shows that weren't approved by the BBC. Basically, this whole pirate radio station situation was made possible by a loophole. You see, since the naval forts were far enough off the coast that they were in international waters, broadcasts could be set up here to play unlicensed content. The British censors were furious, but they could do nothing as it was out of their jurisdiction. That was until a new law was passed called the Marine Broadcasting Act of 1967, which stated that unlicensed stations were illegal if they were conducted by British citizens and broadcast into British territory. As a result, the pirate radio stations on the naval forts, as well as others in the Channel Islands and the Isle of Man, were shut down. As for the individual forts themselves, there were four naval forts in total. The Rough Sands, Sunkhead, Tung Sands, and Nak John Forts. The Nak John Fort is around nine nautical miles off the coast of Essex, where it has been standing since August of 1942. Well, it was decommissioned in 1945, after the European theater of war came to a close with Germany's surrender, the British military still continued maintenance until the late 1950s. Since then, it has fallen into severe disrepair, despite still technically standing. Only a few miles nearby is where the Sunkhead Fort used to be situated decommissioned and abandoned at nearly the same time as Nock John, with the main differentiation here being that the fort was slightly further outside of British territorial waters. So with the controversy surrounding the Marine Broadcasting Act and whether or not the Sunkhead Fort is within jurisdiction or not, the British government decided to act quickly and prevent another pirate radio station from being set up here. So in mid-August of 1967, a squadron of Royal Marine were sent to Sunkhead, where they blew up the naval fort using 3,200 pounds of explosives. Now, all that remains of the fort is a portion of the concrete pillars sticking out of the water. The Tung Sands Fort was built up six miles off the coast of Margate, and throughout the duration of the war was probably the most famous of the naval forts, as the crew were able to sink a German e-boat, though they were quite lucky in how events unfolded, not that it takes anything away from their achievement. In early 1945, a fleet of e-boats was spotted on the radar, and despite having insufficient armaments and the 3.7-inch guns, the Tung Sands crew opened fire. The commander of one e-boat did not know from what direction he was being fired upon, so he ordered his ship to quickly maneuver out of the way where they accidentally crashed into another e-boat, sinking themselves. After the war, issues with the foundation that existed since its construction became even more pronounced as the whole structure started to fall apart. The caretaker crew was evacuated shortly after. Massive sea storms caused even more damage. Despite being uninhabitable, the Tung Sands Fort remained standing until another storm hit the installation in 1996, causing the whole structure to collapse.
Perhaps the most famous of the naval forts in general is the Rough Sands Fort, which became the Principality of Sealand, an independent country. This fort was created to protect Ipswich as well as nearby ports, and it was built upon the Rough Sands Sandbar. During the war, it was manned by about 100 crew members. What makes this fort so interesting, however, is its story after World War II. In the 1960s, a man named Roy Bates, who was a major in the British Army, built a popular pirate radio station on the previously mentioned Knock John Fort. He felt that the BBC's content restrictions, which only allowed paid licensed shows, were unfair. Over time, though, Bates was unable to continue this venture as the British government said that this fort fell within British nautical territory. So Bates abandoned the previous pirate radio broadcasters and moved into the Rough Sands Fort, which was built exactly the same but laid out three miles outside of British jurisdiction. After talking with his lawyers, however, Bates moved on to a completely different endeavor. Citing the Law of Nations, Bates declared the fort an independent country called Sealand, and then he moved his family out to the fort and officially coronated his new country with a flag-raising ceremony, which he designed himself. He even bestowed the title of princess to his wife Joan and developed his own constitution, national anthem, currency, passports, and national football team. Unsurprisingly, Sealand received little international recognition, but unfortunately for Bates, the British government took a hard stance against the new nation, as they wanted to avoid a Cuba-like situation or other possible issues in the Cold War context of the time. The destruction of other nearby sea forts also served as an intimidation tactic to scare off Bates, but he remained undeterred. Sealand would see even more controversy in the late 1970s, as Bates and Alexander Achenbach, a German citizen and Prime Minister of Sealand, had a falling out over plans to expand tourism and the economy. Achenbach wanted to transform Sealand into a hotel and casino, but Bates refused. In retaliation, Achenbach led a group of German and Dutch mercenaries who invaded Sealand after Bates and his wife had left on a business trip. Bates' son Michael was even taken hostage, but he was surprisingly able to break free and overcome the mercenaries, capturing Achenbach using a stash of weapons hidden in the fort. The former Prime Minister of Sealand was then charged with treason, but was sent back to Germany. But there was a silver lining here. You see, the negotiations involved a German diplomat traveling to Sealand, which the Bates family claimed was proof of international recognition of their state. Unfortunately, the story of Sealand largely came to a close in 1987 when a new treaty saw the UK's international territories extend to 12 miles off their coast instead of just three. Since then, Sealand has officially been within British territory and any hope of international recognition has faded away. The reason for the creation of the sea forts was to protect British civilians, industrial towns, and ports from German aerial bombing campaigns. And considering that the brave crews stationed on these forts shot down dozens of German rockets and bombers, as well as preventing other attacks, most would agree that the forts accomplished their mission. While some forts succumbed to the elements of harsh seas, others were blown up by the military and many became pirate radio stations, and one fort even became an independent nation. It's safe to say, that the story of the Monsell Sea Forts is one that should never be forgotten. And perhaps you have ideas for a tale of urban decay that we should share on the program. You can send your story ideas to my Instagram or Facebook. And before you go, don't forget to support our channel by signing up for Enlisted by clicking the link in the description. Get your free bonus today. Otherwise, catch our video about the strangest ships in history and hit that subscribe button. Until next time, this is Ryan Sokash signing off.